Oh, hey, it's Wes. <laughs> As some of you might be aware, I have this light that is on the table here, and it arrived with a fan that did not work, which is a shame because it is a 300 watt LED video light, very expensive, over $1,000, I think. And it only stays on for about three to five minutes at a time, then it just overheats, which just isn't terribly useful when it comes to a video light. And I contacted the manufacturer and I said, I'm gonna open it up and have a look. And instead of them saying, you know what, we'll just repair it or we'll, we'll send you a new one or something because this was sent for a review, they just said, yeah, sure, open it up, have a look. <laughs> I expected them to not like that idea, but uh, apparently they were going right along with it. So I opened it up, this fan did not work if you missed that previous live stream. I'm going to use this fan just a little bit though, because I need a part of it. I'm going to take its wire, just for this little pluggy bit on the end. Aside from that, the fan is essentially useless to me. Whoa. How's my macro lens gonna work out here? It was focusing earlier, there it is. So yeah, I just wanna keep this wiring harness so that I can plug it in more easily. And then, just gonna strip off the heat shrink here so that I have my red and my black wires. Very good. Now the big problem that we have is that the fan that it came with is a 24 volt van, fan. And 24 volt fans are not very common especially in the higher end fan game. And I wanted to put a nice fan in this. I wanted to put a Noctua fan in so it wouldn't be very loud. We'd have lots of airflow, but you can't get a nice 24 volt fan. They're all like industrial applications and stuff. So what we have to do is adapt our 12 volt fan using this little device right here. This will step our voltage down from 24 volts to 12 volts in theory. It might take us a little bit of testing to get that right though. So we're gonna go from the 24 and 32 volt output of our fan controller into our voltage step down device into our new very nice fan that we do not want to burn out or break because it was only about 20 bucks, but 20 bucks is a lot of money for a fan on its own. All right, first things first. <clears throat> I am going to plug the original wiring harness into the main control box for the light. In the previous video, we discovered that this thing, when it's plugged in, will just right away output the voltage to the fan. So it doesn't seem to be based on any temperature control, even though there is a thermistor at the top of the LED panel here in the heatsink. That's just to shut it down if it gets too hot. But the fan runs all the time. So we don't have to worry about uh, speed control, RPMs, voltage monitoring, stuff like that. When the light turns on, the fan turns on. So we can start right from there. I'm gonna separate these wires so they don't short out against each other because the last thing we need to do is uh, break this light. There we go. I'm gonna strip the ends. They are smaller than my wire strippers. One and two. We got our ends of the wire stripped. I have to take our multimeter here. I'm gonna move our uh, very expensive LED block out of the way. <laughs> and get our meter going so that we can measure the voltage coming out of this. Now I have to say right away, do not try, do not try any of this at home, please. We are playing with live wires, although as the power coming into this device is only lower DC voltage because the power supply is external, you can still get a shock from this and there might be some larger capacitors at play in here that we haven't dug up yet. All right. 
So I have plugged this in. Our device is on 100%. I'm going to turn down the power output to the LED right now, just so that we have less power at play. Now let's see what our output voltage is on the fan controller. It is 32 volts DC. So we have our output voltage, that's fantastic. Does it go away when I just hit this power switch? I actually have, let me see here, zero volts. I actually have a couple of lights that as soon as you plug them into power, they start up the fans at 100%, so that's kind of annoying. It, and it's not even a cool down procedure, it just, the fans run all the time if they're plugged in. So this one, the fan shuts off if you shut off power, that is convenient for us right now because we don't want power coming out of this while we're working on it. So we have our two outputs. So I'm going to twist these wires to get them ready to put into our converter board to get our voltage step down. Now this little device, there, there is no data sheet that comes with this. There are no instructions. It just has an out plus, out minus, and an in plus, in minus. And that would lead me to believe at first glance that uh, all four corners here with their doubles are common to each other. But if we look really closely here at this uh, input plus, they appear to have separate tracks on them, which what's going on with that? So I have to pick one of these to use. It's kind of a gamble. I don't know if it's 50-50, but I just have to pick one. So before I get soldering, I am going to use this clamp here to hold my wiring, my board in place so I don't have to hold it. A lot of people would use what's called a third arm or third hand to hold your soldering stuff in place. I don't have one of those. I haven't worked as a technologist in a while. Fair warning, I'm going to be a little rusty with my soldering skills today. <laughs> so I'm not going to make anyone feel bad, that's for sure. Unless you're going to feel bad out of embarrassment for me. So. We're going to hold on to just the tip of the board over here because the soldering might heat up the board. And this is just a uh, just a rubber clamp. And there is a chance that I'll melt my rubber clamp if I get too warm on that side of the board. Let's get a little zoomed in here, a little closer. Maybe we can go even closer. Let's have a look here. Uh, we're gonna switch to APS-C mode. Whoa, now we're real close. That's better. I'm gonna to try to do this so that you can see it. May or may not be a good idea. Whoa. So here we go. Our in plus and in minus. We have soldering iron, we have some solder. There. <clears throat> so in plus. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo on which input to put this on. Careful. Oh, some wires came up. Gotta make it nice and tight. There. There's one and two. I'm going for the far corners based on my eeny, meeny, miny, mo approach, just because I am less likely to less likely to melt other components on the board if I do that. And then, just for test, I'm going to plug this back in again and check my output voltage because there's actually a potentiometer on this that allows you to adjust it. It's supposed to be able to do five or 12 volts. So let's turn this on and see what our board is doing. Thankfully, and unfortunately, I had to buy several of these small boards because they only come in a pack of six. So if I wreck this board, it's no big deal. It is expendable. So no pressure there. So our input voltage here we have 32 volts, and our output voltage here 
is 10.85. Hmm. That's uh, not exactly what we were looking for. So let's see if we can adjust the potentiometer on the other side of it to get us a voltage that we do want. Let's turn this here. And our potentiometer is under here. Sorry if I got my head in the way there. All right, I just turned it 90 degrees. Now what do we have? Two volts. <laughs> I guess I need to turn it back the other way. Now we have 11 volts, just a little further. I assume that this was a stepping potentiometer, but apparently it's linear. It's giving us a lot of options for output voltage. 13.4 volts, so that's good. Most uh, DC power devices, low power, low voltage DC power devices, when they're rated for like 12 volts, they actually run on 13 and a half volts, just like in your car. And similarly, this is a 24 volt, 24 volt fan it actually has 32 volts going to it. So you usually want to overshoot that just a little bit. As soon as you put a load on it, it's going to bog that voltage down a little bit. I don't expect there to be a lot of load coming from this fan, but I don't know what the output impedance of the circuit is. So we don't really know how that's going to balance. So let's get into this and uh, let's get dangerous. So I'm going to rotate this back down again. Oh, don't fall out wire. You were annoying to put in in the first place. There, a wire here, and a wire here. Stay right there, please. There, okay, our wires are ready. It's time for the magic. By magic, I mean, I don't know. I hope I don't screw this up. <laughs> okay. So when you're soldering, in case you haven't soldered before, you want to make contact with both the board and the wire so that when your solder melts, it evenly adheres to both the wire and the board. There we go. That was a... I give that a 6 out of 10 soldering job on that one. Let's see how we can do on number 2 here. Oh, the wire slipped down a little. Let the wire nice and tight up to the top so that the insulation reaches all the way up. And I drank too much caffeine today. My hands are not sturdy. There we go. Looks uh, like a 6.5 to 7 out of 10. I've done better, that's for sure. <laughs> Let's check our uh, output voltage now. And hope we didn't kill the card. 13.3 volts. We have a winner. Let's see if any of these output terminals do anything differently. I don't think they do. Back and forth, no, they're all the same. Okay, so now that we have soldered those in place, we'll want to shorten the wires so they don't touch anything else. I should not have had caffeine today so that my hands would be shaking less. There we go. Make that a little shorter. Make this one a little shorter. Okay. Beauty, beauty. <clears throat> Brian Kilgore said that 62 years ago, he was a wedding photographer in this city. That was a long time ago. 62 years ago, I was not born. <laughs> How was wedding photography 62 years ago, Brian? Tell me that, because I would love to know. All right, let's reverse this board. 
we're going to clamp it on the other side. There we go. Okay. Now, we're getting into our Noctua fan here, and I have a choice to make. This fan has an integrated wiring harness, and it is very nice. This, everything about this Noctua fan is super nice. And I really don't want to cut the integrated wiring harness. So I'm tempted to put an extension on it, but I should really just go for this because it is what it is. Chop, chop. So you'll notice that there are three wires on this Noctua fan, unlike the two wires on our original fan. That's because there is an RPM gauge on this or a tachometer, which we don't need. Oh, poor nice fan, I'm so sorry. So our yellow wire is our tachometer, and we're just going to ignore it. Now, I have to get this wire sheath open a little bit more so I can get at the wires underneath. We're just going to travel up the line here. There we go. Make this a little brighter. Okay. Should have enough wire to work with now. There we go. Chop, chop. And now we just have some wires sticking out of the end. Womp, womp. Kind of sad. It was so nice. I'm going to strip my black and red wires. These wires are much thinner than our other ones. Be very careful not to cut them. And then we twist our wire ends. Welcome to the party, Pedro. I am currently twisting my wire ends because I have to insert them into this circuit board and then I will solder them into place. But right now, I'm not gonna solder them yet. I'm just gonna tap them on and see if this fan turns on. Obviously, I have to be careful about my polarity. I don't know if this fan can take a reverse polarity. A lot of modern electronics have uh, current blocking, so reverse polarity isn't a big deal. But I'm going to double check the polarity coming out of my voltage reduction board here. 13.4, so that is good. So we're going to put, I'm going to move this so you can see the fan, I guess. Fingers crossed that this new fan works for what we're doing out of this conversion board. This is kind of the moment of truth right here, honestly. Why am I so scared? I can replace the voltage board, but I can't replace this fan. Oh yeah, look at that fan go. And it is so quiet. <laughs> the uh, the Noctua fan comes with a couple of adapters that uh, allows you to step down the speed and reduce the, uh, the noise that it makes. But already at maximum speed, this fan is so quiet. And actually, if we can do a little test here and see if this fan is bogging down this voltage converter, because if it is, we'll have to step up the voltage just a little bit. So we'll see what kind of voltage we're going to get off of this. Let's see if it goes down too far while we're connected to the board. I should probably solder this first because uh, that would be much easier. <laughs> and I'll switch camera angles. That is dipping our voltage quite a bit, actually. So I'm going to have to turn that up a little bit. Okay. Let's see what our output voltage is now. 
11, I turned it down by accident, okay. Check now, 15.7 volts. Let's see if that is enough. So again, putting my leads on the board and then connecting. Eleven point six volts. Still need to turn it up a little higher. This bogs down very easily. All right, now it's outputting seventeen volts. I did not expect to have to turn it up this far. And ironically, this voltage step down board actually specifically says to not use it without a decent amount of load. And this doesn't even come close to the maximum load that this board can take. So I'm kind of surprised at how far it's going down here. All right, we're at 11.8 volts. I don't want to start too high, so I think I'm going to leave it right there. And now I will turn off our supply and let's solder this board into place. And by this board, I mean this fan. If you're just joining us, which I see that a few of you are, we are in the process of changing out the fan on this 300 watt video LED video light, the fan that it came with, DOA, putting a beautiful knock to a fan in it, but unfortunately we have to step down our voltage from a 30, 24 to 32 voltage output to a 12 volt output because I wanted to put a nice fan in it and nice fans are 12 volt, not 24. 24 is usually industrial fan. Okay, let's do this. Ah, disconnecting the wiring harness to be perfectly safe here. And let's put our fan in. Once again, I'm going for the opposite corners because if I do that, I am less likely to melt any of the onboard components with a crappy soldering job, which I am not ruling out as a possibility because I am very rusty with my soldering. Any comments or questions? Oh. Yeah, I Pedro asks, is it only a fan issue? I'm pretty sure it's just a fan issue. Everything else seems to be working on the light. The light turns on, it just overheats after a while, and the fan doesn't turn on at all. Okay. Apparently I need to change my focus zone on this uh, close-up shot. Just moving to a different focus box here. There, center focus box so that I stop moving it by accident. All right, next wire. This is so far going as well as I could have expected. Beautiful. I would give that first solder job that I did there about an eight out of 10. Second one, mm, it's got a little clip in the corner there. I'm only gonna say that's about a seven out of 10. Not the best soldering I've done once again, but honestly better than the first two joints I just made. 
Ba-doo. Ba-doo. Okay. Our board is soldered. It's time for some electrical tape. Because the board is just going to be tucked into the back of this light. It's probably going to be pretty hot back there, but I don't think it'll get that hot because uh, it's at the back of the heat sink, which will have obviously the least amount of heat as the heat winds its way down it. I'm going to tape off this yellow wire, which is for the fan tachometer, because our original fan did not have a tachometer. Nothing fancy here. This is a GVM video light, and they're kind of known for just giving you uh, as much bang for your buck as possible with not a lot of frills. And I'm going to put a piece of tape around my board here for a couple reasons. Number one, to avoid shorting out, but number two, I don't want to bump that potentiometer that's deciding my output voltage. We have it set, and we don't want to change it. There we go. Now we obviously need a little bit more tape still. Ideally, I should be using heat shrink to do this. Big old chunk of heat shrink right over this whole board here, but uh, I don't have a big old chunk of heat shrink. I think I'll do one more piece of tape because those joints are kind of sharp and they might pipe, poke through my tape. Oop. There we go. All right, now this is the real moment of truth. I am plugging the wiring harness into the fan output here. And I'm going to turn on the light. Whew. <laughs> there was a slight delay there and I almost died. <laughs> but the fan is working beautifully now. It is incredible how quiet this Noctua fan is compared to, well, just any other fans. You can probably barely hear it in my microphone right now. Was I making sound effects? <laughs> Somebody said I was making Star Wars sound effects. It might be mandatory when working on wiring. <laughs> okay, so our fan is working. It's time to reassemble our light. Might need to zoom out a little bit here because uh, things are gonna get hairy. All right. Woo, earthquake. I'm gonna put away the solder. Let's unplug the soldering iron so I don't burn myself. I'm gonna move that to the back of the room. I probably don't need the uh, wire cutters anymore. Electrical tape might come in later. But I do need my iFixit toolkit. Not sponsored. I wish it was. All right. Now, hopefully, I can remember how to put this very expensive light back together again. The peculiarity about this light is that we've got this beautiful heat sink here. But as soon as you take off the screws, and these four screws essentially hold the entire light together. It's it's crazy. These four screws go through the front of the light and hold the heat sink and the LED onto the back of the light. And they also hold the COB board onto the heat sink. So as soon as you take this thing apart, everything falls apart. There's, there's nothing left to hold it together, which is kind of annoying. So it, it makes it a little bit tricky to work on, but possibly just reduces the number of components that they needed to assemble this. So. We've got the heat sink here, a thermistor. We've got our two powers. One power is for the daylight balance. One power is for the yellow balance. So 
we have to take out these screws that are actually holding our COB LED to the heat sink. And be careful not to knock the heat sink back off again, because it's just held on by uh, some thermal paste right now. Whoa. And then <clears throat> we slide this whole light housing back on. I feel like there's no up and down on this. It's pretty much identical both ways. Yep, I don't I don't think it matters which way this goes. Yep. Okay, here we go. Careful. Oh. Careful. Right up to the top. And the screws. So yep, the screws go through the mount, through the COB light, into the heat sink block. And then the whole thing is suspended from the front like that. I should have gotten my proper screw out for this before I started. Is this the one? Nope. Must be this one. There we go. Get in there. A little worried about stripping screws because this is going into an aluminum block and uh, aluminum blocks are not known for being great places to put screws. <clears throat> Oh no, 1977 Borg is correct. I have skipped a step. <laughs> I have not installed the fan yet. Womp womp. Slide it back out again. We need to put our fan in the heat sink. What are you, crazy, Wes? I put two of these screws back in so the heat sink doesn't slide off again. There we go. And let's put in a fan. Because that's the whole reason that we're here in the first place. <clears throat> and now our orientation does matter a little bit because we want our fan to be blowing up. So we'll just confirm which way the air flows here. Is there something written on this? Oh, there it is. So the air flows up this way on this fan. So we just have to maintain a general upness with everything that we do here. So the fan slots into the middle of the heat sink here. There. And we have two clips that hopefully fit our new fan. I don't see why they wouldn't though. There we go. <clears throat> so this goes over the top of our heat sink. This is probably mechanically the trickiest thing that we're going to do today. Because you just kind of have to bend these wires into place. Did I get this backwards? I did. Am I going to need pliers? I think I might. I think the sides of this knock to a fan are just little bit thicker than the sides of the cheap fan that was in it. So it's a little fighting me a little bit here. There. Oh yeah, she's tight now. And then 
Put our bracket on the other side. Say, so usually the air runs toward the grill, but it's uh, goes both ways on this, so it's not really going in any particular direction. Don't know if the light's working yet. Um, Robert said, any issue overheating the board? Don't think so. Are you talking about the board that I just installed? Because I'm putting in a more powerful fan than it had before. So any previous overheating issues would likely be solved. And that is long term. My biggest risk, though, is that the little control board I'm putting in might either interfere with something or get melted in the back here where it's going to be hiding. Oh. Two clips left. Let's find the right angle to attack this from. There's one. One clip left. Oh, of course this last one's gonna give me grief. Ah, there we go. That is quite secure. <laughs> so now when we install it, we want our air to be going up. I have had some fans in the past, some LED lights in the past where the air has blown down and that that is bizarre. Why on earth would you blow your air down? If a fan fails, or just generally speaking, the fan is going to get a boost just by the fact that hot air is rising. You want to push that up. That is so much easier. Okay. Now let's put the housing on. Okay, just double checking my air direction. So my air is flowing. My air is flowing this way. And so I'm going to put this fan housing on like this because I'm calling this my top. Taking out these sides that protect my wires. There we go. Oh, I didn't take out the screws. My wife would kill me if I worked on my kitchen counter. Yes, Robert, this all has to be gone <laughs> by the time she gets home. However, there is some precedent for this, I must say. I don't know how long you've subscribed to my channel, but a long, long time ago, my channel used to exclusively run from the kitchen because that was the biggest, nicest room in our house at the time. And a lot of people thought that it was a backdrop or it was CGI, which, goodness, I don't have the budget for CGI, or it was a green screen, but no, it was my kitchen. <laughs> and between my kitchen and my office was a, a nice little countertop that made for a great place to make videos. There we go, got two screws in. And I recall when I took these screws out, I was really surprised at how loose they were. There's no Loctite on these screws. There's just a little bit of thermal compound leaked into the holes. That's about it. And I assume that they're loose because they're screwed into aluminum, but I'm going to make them a little bit tighter than they were when I took it apart, that's for sure. There we go. Okay. There. Okay. Flip it around. Now we have these plexiglass panels that go in the back. To keep the wires separated from the heat sink. 
one. Nope. And two. I don't know why they're plexiglass, but uh, they are. <laughs> Gans Technerd says, thankfully I cook and manage the kitchen at my home, so not much of an issue there. <laughs> Generally speaking, though, you don't want to come home from work and expect to have supper, and instead you are confronted with a giant pile of uh, electronics, which is actually what happened when I first took this apart, because, yeah, I started too late in the day. <laughs> okay. Let's unplug our controller before we plug in all of our devices here. So on the back of the controller here we have a white out, a yellow out, we have our fan out, oh sorry, our fan out, and oh, I am not on camera. So we have a white out, a yellow out, a fan out, and a thermistor, a thermometer for overheat control. So let's put this thermometer in here. There we go. Now we'll plug in our motor. Nope, that's not it. It's a long cable. There we go. Ah, I missed. Fan is plugged in. One LED wire. It's almost surprising how small these wires are given the amount of power that gets pushed into that. Uh, there, there. Nope, I'm upside down. Hmm. Nope, this did not go the way I had planned. Making mistakes all over the place here, everyone. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> so I actually want to put that like that. It's fine. That's up there. Is that gonna reach? Yep. There. <laughs> Got a bunch of comments here. Away from your light and not towards your light. Well, the, the air is blowing straight up out of the light, not toward the light. Although I have had a lot of fan, a lot of LED lights also, funny that you should say that, that blow the air straight down toward the LED and out into the softbox, which I thought was problematic, but I did a bunch of uh, temperature checks and uh, it actually seemed to function even better. So that was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> All right, let's plug everything in. There. Fan goes here. There. Here. All right, where's my control board? I want that toward the middle so it's not touching the heat sink. There we go. The back is on. Where did I put those other screws? I guess I should go get those. <laughs> so it doesn't fall apart as soon as I pick it up. 
No, they're not there. Oh, here they are. Went back to the studio, found some screws and a sleeping cat. Should I test it before sealing it? Well, it's very easy to take those screws back out again, but sure, let's do it. Okay, I'm going to point this not at me. <laughs> Got some beautiful airflow. And 100% power. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the fan. It's actually a little louder than I expected it to be, probably just from the turbulence of the air flowing through the device itself. But yeah, a few feet away, that's not very loud at all. Back off. Unplug. <sighs> Faintly hear it. Yes, it is very bright. It says it's a 300 watt light. I kind of have some doubts there, honestly. I'm gonna to have to test that, but uh, because the fan wasn't working, I didn't want to do a load test and see how much power it was actually drawing because it could be drawing more power because it's getting too hot. That can increase internal, the internal load or also like we're missing the load of the fan, which turns out to be very, very small anyway. So yeah, if it wasn't entirely working, I just didn't want to test that yet. So we'll test it real soon and see if it's actually a 300 watt LED because it doesn't seem that much brighter than my 150 and 200 watts. The light would run for three to five minutes depending on what power level it was on. So if it was on low power, it'd get like five or six minutes. If it was on high power, we'd get like two or three minutes out of it. The fan wouldn't run at all though. The fan just never turned on from day one. And so that's kind of annoying because like I've gotten stuff in the past where you, you use it for a few days and then something fails. Like I have a Godox light right here that the very generic power switch on it failed after two weeks. And it's hard to blame Godox for it. In, in part, it's their fault because they chose kind of a cheaper part. But at the same time, it's not a QA issue. It worked when I got it. It didn't break in shipping. It was working fine out of the factory. So I can't blame them that hard for that. But this one, I plug it in for the first time and that fan just doesn't work. So I almost, I kind of have to assume that when it left the factory, the fan didn't work. Maybe it broke in shipping, but I don't think it's a mechanical failure. It's probably the wires inside or the motor or something. Because when you plug it in, it does a little eh, move just a tiny bit, but I don't know. It's a worse problem when you get something right out of the box and it doesn't even doesn't even work right. Reading comments here. Seems like a 200 watt light. Yeah, I'm suspicious that it might be, but the, uh, the CLB LED board in the front of it is actually a custom board. It actually has GVM written on the PCB itself. So it might be 300 watts. I don't know yet. AJ says, let's test it right now for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, guys. <laughs> I'll have to get a light stand just so it doesn't fall over. We'll be right back. <clears throat> Hi, Maggie. I found a cat. <laughs> he did not want to be woken up. Here is a light stand. All right. There. And the power supply. This one has a very short DC end to the cable, which is incredibly annoying. I've complained about this sort of thing in the past before. 
So I gotta like wrap this around here or something. And on top of that, I am going to get my watt meter. Be right back, it's in the garage here. <clears throat> so that we can put this uh, power consumption to rest right away. Put that in, ah, there we go. And we'll switch the output to watts. And we will turn this on. Fan still going, 100% output. 246 watts, 245. Someone's at the door. I think I have a package. This is not a very exciting unboxing, I'm afraid, because <laughs> I know what this is. Two 10 packs of N95 masks. <laughs> Not photography related. Okay, I'm gonna move this a little bit off screen here, just so it's not completely killing my uh, shot. That's a little better. All right, 243. Now the question is, does the output of this the power consumption change given the Kelvin? Because on the uh, Godox light mons and the new small rig lights, the power output or power input, which results in output, changes dramatically depending on what Kelvin you're using. So let's see what happens here. Looking at my power meter, switch this to Kelvin. All right, I'm gonna start at the bottom, 2700 Kelvin. We are 129 watts. <laughs> that is a massive difference. I expected it to go down, but not by that much. So 129 watts at 2,700 Kelvin. 4,000 Kelvin, 189 watts. 5,000 Kelvin, 241 watts. Let's see where it peaks. Well, I think that was my peak. Yeah, 5,000. Sorry about the mic touching. It would appear that 5,000 Kelvin is the maximum power usage of this light. Oh, 5,100 is more. No, so 5,100 is my max power usage, and that is. 250 watts in my 300 watt light. <laughs> now let's crank her all the way up to the bluest. We're at 7,500 Kelvin and already all the way back down to 124 watts. And my exposure is very blue now. The light that I'm using to light myself is about 180 watts. So this is still more light. I can't complain about that. And especially when we're close to daylight balance, let's go 5,600 K. We are using 214. So that is still brighter than a, a normal 200 watt light. Cause normally like uh, someone was saying, uh, Gan Z tech nerd was saying, 200 watts is usually the high she'll go with most commodity LED video lights. You're just not going to get higher than that unless you go into something way more expensive. And so coming from GVM, it is somewhat impressive that we are pushing at daylight balance 214 watts. Most 200 watt lights, again, don't quite hit 200. Some do, some don't. And if we just go down to 5100, which 
it's fine. That's close enough to daylight. You balance your white, your white balance in your camera that you can use that. We're pushing about 250 watts, which is more power than almost anything else in this form factor. Now, <laughs> let me look at the comments here just a little bit more here. Maybe turn it away from us. I did. I'm just, just too bright in this room. <laughs> yeah, it is a most lights you get a very weird output because you have losses from the power supply, you've got losses from the fan and stuff, and it adds up to an odd number. Odds are the board is rated for a certain amount, and you've got control circuitry, and I feel like they often don't design lights based on an actual expected output. They just put a bunch of components together and give it a name, and what it has, it has. <laughs> like the Lightmon's LA150, it's not 150 watts. It's all over the place. Um, <clears throat> Tech Nerd just asked, what's the power usage at daylight? I've mentioned that before, but back to 5600K, it is 215, 214 watts. So it is a decent amount. It is more than 200. And let's turn this down. <laughs> or should I turn it down? Should I leave it at 100% this whole time? Just to see if it overheats? I'm pretty sure that this has already been on for longer than uh, it lasted in its previous life. That's that's for darn sure. Let me angle this away a little bit, maybe. Oh boy, it's so bright. <laughs> okay, maybe I should change my exposure here. Do, do. That's a little more palatable. Focus. Is the body warm? Leave it. Six minutes so far. Somebody is timing this. AJ is timing this and I am not. The body is a little bit warm. Not that much. Do I have to get my thermometer out? I guess I will. Look out, Maggie, I'm getting my thermometer. In case you didn't know, my cat's name is Maggie. Here it is. My cat's names are Maggie and Veronica because who wants to name their cat something normal? Thermometer. All right. I want to do this from an angle because I don't want to accidentally sh read through the grills. I only want to read the outside of the body here. Yeah, just reading the outside of the body, we're just below 40 degrees Celsius, which is not that bad in my experience, especially with this much output that we're getting. We're still at 100% output here. <clears throat> uh, let's check the front, just out of interest. So the aluminum immediately surrounding the, the COB LED, 33 degrees Celsius, not warm at all. The aluminum of the Bowens mount is 28 degrees Celsius. Control board in the back, 28. Oh, that's warmer than I thought it would be. LCD display, 29. Ooh, let's look at the power brick. This has a very interesting power brick because, let's get this on camera here. This is the power brick. It's got a bunch of Velcro on it right now because you can attach it to a light stand. Unfortunately, I don't have a color accuracy tester majingy. I'm trying to get one I'd like to do a partnership with Seconic or something, but nobody wants to talk to me. <laughs> I'm not good at getting partnerships. The interesting thing about this power supply is it has a fan in it. I'm not sure if I can show this, maybe with the close-up camera. Whoa, way too close. Yeah, there we go. So with the close-up camera, you can see there is an opening at the top and bottom, and you can kind of see the fan from here. <laughs> and thankfully this fan is working. 
So air comes in the bottom, goes right at the top here. And this lets us do our job. And this power supply is rated for 300 watts. So looks like they did expect it to pull 300 watts. And thankfully, we're not pushing our luck with this power supply, at least. Oh, we're on camera here. There we go. Here in India, quality options are less, and the parts for repair are seldom available in the open market. I feel like you still might have more available stuff. I don't know. Just uh, this fan here. Finding a replacement for this in Canada was a pain in the butt. Like, I could have paid 60 bucks from an electronics vendor after shipping and all that to get this in, which would have been just ridiculous. That's why I went with the Noctua, because it's just a PC gaming part, essentially, which is highly commoditized. I can just get that on Amazon for $20. And then I got a, a six part of the voltage stepper for $20 again. So it cost me $40 to fix this light, but I think the light's like a thousand US dollars. So it's worth doing that. <laughs> yeah, I would not want to have to fix anything from Aerie because that's going to be some proprietary parts and some inflated numbers, that's for sure. Let's see what else is in here. What would color temperature do with power output? I feel like Robert missed that because we went through that whole thing. Our uh, power output goes all the way down to, well, let's just do it again. Our power output goes all the way down at one end of the spectrum to 125 watts. Then in the middle, at the peak, we're at 250 watts. Then back up in the blue end, at 7500K, we're down to 123 watts. So that has a huge effect on the power output. I'm keeping it at 5100 because that is peak. That is my stress test. That is 250 watts that it's burning through right now. Um, <clears throat> But it is incredibly common for these lights to change their power output depending on what color they're putting out. Most of them peak in the middle like that. I tested all of the bicolored lights I had and they all had a curve. I'm gonna produce a chart or graph for that eventually once I have enough of them tested, just to see if some of them are sharper than others. I, I know for a fact that this power curve is way sharper than any of the other ones that I've tested. It's, it doubles. Most of them are only around like 25, 30% difference. So that really makes a big difference. AJ, how are we doing with the timer? A few minutes ago, he said 10 minutes, but I wasn't watching when that came in. So uh, I'm not sure how long that was. What time is it here? 2.11. Got to keep an eye on the time so that I can clean the kitchen out before anyone else gets home. <laughs> Okay, put that screw back. I can throw this wiring harness in the garbage, even though it's really nice. Throw this fan in the garbage. It was never nice. I wish I knew how loud that original fan was, but I could not even look it up by its part number. It has a part number on it. It just doesn't seem to exist. If I was in China, maybe I could find it, but uh, I could not locate it. So I can't find the specs and see what it's actual decibel rating is supposed to be. The Noctua fan is supposed to be 17 decibels, I think, but that seems pretty optimistic to me, honestly. 17 decibels is completely inaudible. Maybe it's from a few feet away. Let me go find the Noctua box. Better bring the Noctua box upstairs already. Oh, it was right in front of me. <clears throat> Camera angle switch. Here's the Noctua box. This is too bright. There we go. Now I know how to get enough light in my kitchen. So on the box, it says acoustic noise DBA 17. That is is clearly louder than 17. I mean, it is very, very quiet. AJ says we're at 14 minutes now. Mm, yeah, it is less likely for me to get knockoff parts in Canada, at least. But it, it does happen a lot, and it happens a lot more than most people realize. 
a lot of people are buying knockoff like chargers and headphones and just random components and kind of are none the wiser in Canada. A lot of people don't think about it, but they should. So the fan was definitely not 17 dBA. Thankfully, Apple Watch now have uh, calibrated decibel meters in them. Not 100% accurate, but at three feet away, Forty-two decibels. That is very quiet. Not the most quiet. Yep, still forty-two. Right at the fan. Forty-nine decibels. Not bad at all. Um, the quietest light that has a fan that I have tried is that that little Godox. Was the ME seventy? Anyway, the little tube-shaped one, that is unbelievably quiet. But it has a fan. You can feel the air going through, but it's a very, very quiet fan. I could have used the, uh, the quieter modes in this Noctua, but I'd rather have good feeling, cooling. If it's only going to be about 40 decibels, that's fine. As soon as you put a softbox on that, get it six feet away from you, you're not going to hear it very much. It is a shame that... Uh, the fan doesn't turn down as you turn down the power of the light. There is no such control inside the fan for that. Well, since AJ said 14 minutes a few minutes ago, I would say we have passed the 15 minute mark here. And it's working fine. Let's do another temperature check though. Again, doing it askance so I don't Look at the actual heat fins inside because those are going to be hot and that's their problem, not mine. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> We're up to 44 degrees Celsius where the air actually hot air comes out. On the LCD display, we're at 40 degrees. Right next to the COB light, a measly 35 degrees Celsius. So. Obviously, the heatsink is doing a fantastic job on this. Like, it's cooler at the COB than it is where the heat is coming out. So, that's working very well, which I am not surprised at. That was a very beefy heatsink. The only thing that I was worried about is that the, uh, that maybe I had ruined the, uh, <coughs> the thermal paste that was on it, and I don't have extra thermal paste, and I didn't want to buy more thermal paste for this because I didn't think it was that important. As long as this thing isn't getting to, 80, 90 degrees, it's probably not much of an issue. So, any more questions before we shut this down? Because I think that we have succeeded at our task today. Everyone's looking pretty quiet. <laughs> I know there are nine people watching though, so. Two more minutes to get to 20. AJ really wants us to push it all the way to 20 minutes. <laughs> and sure, let's do that. Anything else to clean up here? Don't need this for the screws anymore. Put my scissors back. Put the wire strippers back. <laughs> Any new shoots in the future? I have lots of shoots in the future. <laughs> you don't see most of the shoots that I do because they're for clients. And I don't like using client shoots for YouTube. I know a lot of YouTubers who are still doing professional work and client work will use their client shoots. I'm thinking of like Taylor Jackson and people like that, or Sam Hurd. And, you know, they'll do a GoPro with their client shoot. I just, I cannot bring myself to do that. And so a lot of the time I try to do specific shoots to start out with for the things that I'm testing, just to be 100% sure that it's gonna work out. And then if it does work out, if it does work well enough to work in a professional setting, professional setting, then I will bring it on a client shoot, but I'm not going to film that client shoot because that's that's not what they signed up for. <laughs> that's not what they're there for. So if I really want to get behind the scenes and you know get in the nitty gritty of something, I'm going to do a shoot specifically for the YouTube content. 
but I really like it when something works well enough that I can bring it out into the field on a professional shoot. For me, that's when it really matters, when I've done a specific test for it, and then I've done it on a professional shoot, and then I've continued to test it for at least two or three weeks. That's when things really work. Uh, no, a Aperture doesn't really uh, want to share much with me. They have multiple times offered to send me their little tiny handheld LED panels, but I'm, I'm not interested in doing those videos anymore. They're way too commoditized. No one's interested in watching those. And, you know, bleh. AJ says we're done. <laughs> we have reached the 20 minute mark. Let's take a final temperature test here. Do, 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 do. Surprisingly, our temperature is still rising. We're at 46 degrees Celsius now. 45 at the back screen. And, oh, no, something went wrong here. 43 degrees on the side of the COB. So it is still heating up. I didn't expect it to continue heating up for that long. <clears throat> What am I using to stream with multiple cameras? Ooh. This is what I'm using. I have an ATEM Mini, and that is plugged in via USB-C into my laptop, and all of my cameras, you can see the mess I made at lunchtime in a second here. Whoop. We have an A7 IV and a cat, we have an A9 with a macro lens, and the one I'm twisting around is a 16 to 35 on the A7 III. And now we are all askew. I hope you're happy. <laughs> and so they're all feeding in via HDMI. Actually, the, uh, the A9 is plugged in with a Hollyland transmitter because I didn't have another HDMI cable long enough to get over to the switcher. But I love the ATEM products. Something that really shocked me is that this uh, ATEM Mini, is charging my MacBook Pro while I am using it. So it's plugged in via USB-C to get, to pretend that it's a webcam into the computer. And that USB-C cable is charging my MacBook Pro. And that kind of blew my mind because this only has a 35 watt power adapter. So it's giving all it can to keep this laptop charged, which is very interesting. I love the Black Magic products. Some people say they're not professional products. That may be the case, but I love how they don't intentionally do market segregation. They don't hit their uh, products with the cripple hammer. They just pack every little bit of functionality and compatibility into everything that they do. And that is admirable. And they're kind of the only company that does that. They just put everything in and just let it work. That's fantastic. So light's still working. It's kind of hot though, but that's fantastic. We're going to have a full review of that coming later on. But until next time, I've got to clean out this kitchen. And tomorrow, I'm going to go take some photos. <laughs>